Encore with Claire O'Brien. Arts and entertainment for the Midlands. With Padders Bar, In Moat, Gertie Brown's Bar and Bistro Athlone and the Cellar Bistro Strand Street Athlone. How can a historical entertainer help you to see the stories you already knew in a brand new way? What's it like to see yourself in six foot images and video and completely made up? And if you're at this time of the year and wondering what career to take on following the Leaving Cert results and the start of college and you're not too sure, Oshin McGann, illustrator, has some advice. While well, you're listening to Encore on Midlands 103, it's Claire O'Brien here and I'm here every Thursday night between 7 and 8, bringing you the best of what's happening in the arts in Leash, Offaly and Westmeath. Encore at midlands103.com is the email address. Please do drop me a line. I'd love to hear from you. And 083 30 10 103 is the Lamb Brothers Midlands 103 text line if you'd like to get in touch tonight during the show. So we have some big questions for you. What is it like to see yourself in six foot images and video and made up beyond the nines? Well, if you were listening to the programme last week, you'll know I brought you the first half of an interview with makeup artist, artist James Mack, who has what is going to be an extraordinary masterclass tomorrow night in the Dunham Ace Theatre. It will be one of those once in a lifetime, were you there when kinds of events, because he will be showing how he creates those extraordinary faces, those masks those stories with makeup very often on his own face and they're really the, the exhibition that's happening at Donna Mays at the moment uh, is just stunning so we'll bring you the second half of that interview this evening we'll also bring you um the second part of an interview I did a good while ago with Oshin McGann and while I was chatting to him about some work that he had done uh, at an exhibition around young people and managing waste we talked about careers in illustration and Oshin will will tell us a little bit about whether it's possible for young people today to make a career in the business of illustration. But we're going to start the programme tonight with Paddy Cullivan. And Paddy Cullivan is a name that would be very familiar to you if you have ever seen or heard the Camembert Quartet. They are phenomenal musicians, but uh, Paddy is a man who has a witty and ironical and satirical tongue. He is also obsessed with history. He is the writer of a number of history shows, uh, The Murder of Michael Collins, The Murder of Wolf Tone, and one that he is, The Murder of Wolf Tone is, sorry, The Murder of Michael Collins is in Port Leash tonight at eight o'clock. So you'll still have time to get to that. Um, But next week in Mullingar, he's bringing his new show, I Can't Believe It's Not Ireland, to the stage at the Mullingar Arts Centre. I was chatting to Paddy earlier on this evening in the Dunham Ace Theatre as he was getting ready for tonight's show. And I asked him, first of all, what in the world is a historical entertainer? Well, I suppose, um, you know, I went to art college. I was a musician for many years. I still am. The Camembert Quartet is going strong. Um, But I think what I wanted to do was try and bring history to people in a live context and make it fun and interesting. You know, because sometimes it can be quite dry and academic. So, what I do is I, my shows have about 300 in kind of slides, um, images, pictures, historical stuff. Um, I have songs in the show. I have a lot of comedy in the show. And I tell an outrageous story that is both shocking but also enlightening. And, you know, that's what I was doing um, with my Murder of Wolf Tone show and my Murder of Michael Collins show. And now I've moved on to doing a new show about the future, which is kind of based on Collins and Tone's vision. But it's also very friendly to all the communities on this island. It's called I Can't Believe It's Not Ireland, about a future United Ireland in 2032. And I'm using future images made out of AI and stuff like that. So the shows are very entertaining. They're great fun. You walk away enlightened. Um, but in the case of the, the murder of Michael Collins and Wolf Tone, you, you, you're, you know, you're kind of, your ideas are that you previously had about these historical figures are changed utterly. But with the future one, I think I'm trying to make people feel optimistic as well. Okay. And you, your your approach, uh, certainly in the satire that people will have known you very much from, is is to to take a really critical eye uh, of events uh, and uh, and to to interrogate them. And is that what happens in the performances? Yes, definitely. Like for instance, in the, the murder of Wolf Tone, we're told that he did himself in in prison. I have 
done a totally. I, I just went back to source material and everything, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a fabrication completely. The same with Michael Collins at Bale Nabla, and there's much more than meets the eye with that. I did original research. The guy that they claim shot him couldn't use his right arm. He'd never done rifle training. Uh, but the the problem is we fall in love with our stories in Ireland, and so you know I'm I'm using my satirical approach as well. I wrote for Oliver Callan on, on Callan's kicks a lot, but. It, it, it has to become satirical because the way these histories were put together, in fact, is a farcical thing. The, the newspapers were full of lies, both in 1798 and in 1922. And I think what I've done now with the, with the new show about the future United Ireland, because I bring it through the history of Ireland from ancient times to plantation to partition. And I think I'm trying to make people think newly about the Protestant influence in Ireland, because many people think that the Protestants, you know, they came here and they were very stuck in their ways. But in fact, they're the people who brought us republicanism. They're the ones who brought us enlightenment. And they were the ones who changed their minds successively again, including, I hope, in 2030, when they decide in an enlightened fashion again. So <laughs> we're better off together. We are better off together, you know. Yes. What, what matter if a different shrines, we pray to the same God. Um, tell me. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about um, the, the interest that you developed, particularly in history and in these characters, because when you look at those first two shows and the one that's on in Port Leash tonight, the, the murder of Michael Collins, they are... They're very particular men with a very particular role in society. Um, yes, I think, I mean, you know, Michael Collins was a huge fan of Wolf Tone. His father would have told him all about Wolf Tone. And Wolf Tone, to me, is the most important man in Irish history. He was a Protestant with a Catholic mom from Dundalk who nonetheless um, came up with the still the most radical idea of all, which is that the three communities in this island, the Catholics, the Protestants and the dissenters, should forget about their differences and come under the common name of Irishman. And to this day, it's still the most radical idea. Michael Collins himself was very similar. Uh, when he wrote the Constitution, he opened the Irish Shannad. And the Shannad, of course, was populated mainly with Southern Irish Protestants because he wanted them to have a say and have a place. Mm. So the leader of the Senate was obviously W.B. Yeats. And of course, this is what I'm trying to show in the new show as well, is that, again, if these men... Uh, whether they were Protestants or whether they were sympathetic to Protestants, they understood the complex nature of Ireland. And that's what I try and get across in the shows as well, and especially in the new one where, you know, um, I, I really want us to free ourselves. I, I am an Irish Republican, obviously, but I'm also someone who, you know, was at the electric picnic doing I Can't Believe It's Not Ireland in the tent to 30 people uh-huh. while 70,000 kids were shouting up the rah. And my, all I can say about that is more wolf tone, less wolf tones. I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and look, it's, look it, it's not to besmirch people's background or what they like, but my problem is we, we kind of fit into these identities far too easily. You know, that to be truly Irish, you must be into the GAA, you must be into the Wolf Tones, you must be into this. Uh, I, I part, I, I'm different from that completely because, you know, my parents raised me in kind of progressive schools and all of this, and it's weird. So, it, you know, I kind of got a taste of how the other half lived. I went to Mount Temple, the same school where you two went. So, I, I just tend to see things differently. And that's what I'm trying to bring to the shows is give people a different perspective, maybe think a bit differently about how and what it is to be Irish. I'm, I'm interested in this idea, you know, that, that history is written by the victors. But in the case, from what you're saying, of, of the Michael Collins and of Wolf Tone, it's written by people who have a very particular agenda to follow. And it's really interesting, just on the way in this evening, I was listening to a podcast um, where... The, the podcaster was um, doing an analysis of the the come up, as the young people would say, of Donald Trump and how when he was involved in The Apprentice, how he was actively built up as a character in order to have an impact on the audience. But the audience today is not the same audience that it was in the early 2000s. And the audience who is looking at our Irish history now is not the same as it was was um, in, in 1800 or in 1925? No. Um, and, you know, we have such access to stuff. I mean, when, in the case of Donald Trump, I find it so funny because my mother's American. We grew up with Donald Trump. He was a, he was a, a, a hotelier and a builder. And then he had a TV show. So the, the, the idea that he is somehow Hitler, I just keep thinking to myself, people keep misspelling the word hotelier and pronouncing it <laughs> Hitler. Uh, you know, it, it is crazy. And, and, but we do this. We create our enemies. We create our bad guys. And in the case of Collins and Tone, very much they were the government. The government wrote about it, and they are the ones who gave it the perspective. Um, you know, and, and in, in the case of the Protestant people in Ireland and what happened in the North and Partition, we were told a very a, a story as well about plantation, how these people came in and took this land. 
Well, they didn't. The earls left the land and the tenants were left there because even under the Irish system, the Irish people were tenants to big rich men who left. And then the king who owned the land then just brought in more tenants and made them the tenants of the land. So it's not as simple as people just coming in and taking uh-huh. over. Uh, and, and, you know, th- this is very important for people to remember that. Um, and as well as that, you know, I think what I'm, what I'm trying to do is by seeing clearly and by, by looking clearly at history and getting rid of all the old cliches and all the old rubbish we've been, we've been told and taught. And there is an agenda. And I have to tell you, Claire, like I'm, I'm public enemy number one, I have to say, in terms of academia and historians. and so, But there, there are plenty who support me as well. And, there, and like, I'm, I just want to make it clear to people, everything I do is sourced from the very same sources that every professional historian uses. I'm just telling a different story with the source. Because like you say, we can look at material and go, OK, that's the story there. But why not look at it differently and say, well, actually, this suggests something far more nefarious. In the case of Wolf Tone, for instance, where's the razor, the magic razor that he used? It went missing. And in fact, his jailer was a collector of collectibles. He collected not only Tone's death mask, but Robert Emmett's death mask. In the case of Michael mm-hmm. Collins, where's his rifle that he was holding at Bay on the Blah? It's never mm-hmm. turned up. And like every year in auction houses, we get these things auctioned. Michael Collins slippers, Michael Collins walking stick. And again, what I'm trying to do is show people a new perspective and say, guys, there's more than meets the eyes of this. It's a very weird story. It's a story we've told ourselves, but why should we believe it? Well, on the subject of believing it, because if history is a story from the past, told as truthfully as possible. Um, but we was, also have losers' history, Claire. Like we do the, have losers. Not just the winners' right history, yeah. we have losers' history, where, where the losers have to tell a good story, because our, our stories are very unfair. And we lose all the time. And so we have to big it up. Well, I'm coming back to this, yeah, this idea of the good story. And and shout out to Mr. Conor Byrne and the CBS and Carlo. The uh, first years in 1L think he's a great teacher and they're mad about him after three days. And obviously he's able to do something to to hold their attention and keep them entertained uh, and engaged. Um, But how, how do you engage and entertain and keep the attention of a, a jaded audience or an audience who have a particular view of history? Well, again, this is why I do historical entertainment. I, the, the images are incredible. The songs are great. It, it's, it's very colourful and fast flowing. I opened the Colin show with a movie. I opened the I Can't Believe It's Not Ireland with a, with a recreation of Star Wars um, telling us what's happened in 2032 in the future. And so uh, all of these things are brought in. Popular culture is brought in to kind of get it across to you. I've done it in schools. I've done these shows in schools and mm. kids love them uh, because Kids, again, are more used to that, to like a fast visual culture, a visual culture, as opposed to reading. And that's what I'm trying to get across. And I think, you know, young and old have come along and really enjoyed it. But especially with the new show, uh, which I'm doing in Mullingar next Tuesday. I'm doing in Burr in November. Um, go to paddycullivan.com to get tickets to all of that. But, you know, the, the, what I'm trying to get across is, you know, um, by, by teaching this history so simply and so directly, um, I can also teach us how to, get rid of jettison the stuff that is holding us back. There's a lot of things holding us back as a country and it's a lot of it is self-created and I think we, people have walked out of the, the new show and said, my God, I feel so optimistic all of a sudden because there's not a lot to feel optimistic about in the world, Claire, uh-huh. and we need to lead the way. We need to lead the way because it was men like Wolf Tone and Michael Collins who brought us to a certain point, you know, and we are peacemakers, you know what I mean? And that's what we should be in the world and that's what I'm trying to get across in the new show that we, it's, I know it's hard, but we shouldn't be picking sides and we shouldn't be trying to involve ourselves. We should be the ones finding the third way, the way out of conflict. And can I ask you finally then, is that where it starts for you, particularly in terms of the, of the new show? Is that the idea that you start with or is there an image that you begin with? Where does a new show come from for you, like this one particularly? Well, the new show comes from things, well, it, really it comes from the amazing research of Professor Brendan O'Leary who interviewed people north and south with this Aaron's project. And he found that Southern Irish people were far more reluctant to give up things like the flag, like the anthem, like where the capital city would be, like rejoining the Commonwealth. And I I investigate that in the show. And what I show people is you're going to have to give up the flag. You're going to have to give up the anthem and you're going to have to give, you know, move a city somewhere else because no one's going to agree on whether it's Belfast or Dublin. Belfast has a better parliament building, but Dublin's the capital you're going to have to pick Athlone in Westmead. I'm afraid that that's where it's going to have to be. But in doing this is great fun. And I compose a new anthem and I have a, a brand new parliament building in the middle of the Shannon. And, and all of these things are done with AI. AI is our friend, not our enemy. And, and I'm, I'm, what I'm showing is a brand new Ireland with high speed rail, with 
everything is solved and uh, even the Tato crisis, you know, which Tato do we pick? Right? <laughs> like I, I pick things from the most trivial thing in the world to actually the most important things. And it's all based on the great work of these men and the great vision they had. You know what I mean? Um, they, they were trying to make a better world. Now, you may not agree with their methods, but they were truly, truly, truly trying to do that. And that's what I'm trying to do as well. OK, well, the only decision then to be left is you're going to get AI to bring back John McCormack to sing the the um, anthem in the middle of the Shannon or are you going to put Niall Horan on the job? That is really the question. Well, we know the old story about John McCormack on the Shannon where, um, you know, um, General Sean McKeown was saying, um, will you sing this? And John McCormack said, oh, no, 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 please, no, no. And Sean McKeown says, Asher, I'll sing it then. <laughs> right in front of John McCormack. <laughs> and I kind of like the bravado of the man. <laughs> And there you go. That is Paddy Cullivan. And I can tell you and you can tell yourself he's absolutely on fire. And that was just in the last hour ahead of the show that he's doing tonight in Port Leash. Uh, if you fancy a lively uh, and entertaining interpretation of history, he is doing the murder of Michael Collins tonight in Port Leash at the Dunamase Theatre at eight o'clock. Next week on the 10th of September, he is in Mullingar doing his new show, I Can't Believe It's Not Ireland, taking you forward to 2032. On the 2nd of October, he will be in Roscommon with the same show and in Burr on the 20th. 2nd of November. If you want to find out more or book tickets for any of those events, obviously at the relevant Arts Centre, but also on paddycullivan.com. Now, we are going to go to something completely different, um, and that is to the visual arts. And when we come back after the break, we'll hear from Oshin McGann. And Oshin is a a very, very well-known, renowned Irish il- children's illustrator. And he'll be telling us about whether it's possible for a young person today, 2024, to make a career as an illustrator. You're listening to Encore on Midlands 103. Get in touch. 83 30 10 103. Encore with Gertie Brown's Bar and Bistro, an award-winning gastro pub in the heart of Athlone with live music and high-quality bar food served daily. Find Gertie Brown's on Facebook and Instagram. Midlands 103. Such a great show. Brian Moss's Saturday Beat, the best of music, the best of chat, and he is just such an entertaining entertaining and interesting broadcaster is a great programme to have on as you're doing your bits and pieces on a Saturday you're listening to Encore here on Midlands 103 with me Claire O'Brien Encore at midlands103.com is the email address and I would love to hear from you and still to come on the programme I'll be bringing you that second part of the interview I did with James Mack a really extraordinary exhibition that is on show at the moment in the Dunamace Arts Centre and of course tomorrow night he will be doing his master class in the Dunamace Arts Centre and tickets are available for that. But before we get all the way to there, we're going to go back a little bit in time because a couple of months ago, just at the start of the summer really, uh, I spoke to the illustrator Oshin McGann and we were talking about the work that he was doing as part of an exhibition in the library uh, about waste and how to manage waste and he had done a series of boards. Um, And I asked him, just at the end of the interview, I started to ask him about whether it was possible to have a career as an artist uh, in the twenty twenty in the twenty first century, and it just, it became a really interesting conversation. So we continued the chat and uh, decided we'd put it aside and have it for you to listen to at a later date. And this is really the time, isn't it, when young people are making their final decisions about where they're going to go, and a lot of young people are still not sure where they're going. So if you're thinking about a career in illustration and art uh, if you're that way inclined uh, this is what Oshin McGann had to say. Back then we didn't have artists or writers visiting schools, I didn't know any artists or writers and, and most of them you know, most of the ones we heard about in Ireland were dead um, so I had I'd switched to, I, I wanted to do a science um, but I was always still doing art so back then this is kind of way in the olden days when we did the insert um, you didn't have to do any um, academic side to art up until third year. So it was just practical. So when I found out you could just sign up for the exam without having done any classes, I thought, well, I'll give it a try. So I got an A in the exam um, in art, never having done art in school. Um, and I uh, kind of thought, okay, right, well, maybe I should be paying attention to that. So, um, and then not long after that, um, I went to a careers night where there were art colleges. Um, and I kind of, at this point, I was seriously into comics. That was my main kind of, um, my main artistic influence. And I kind of went home to mum and dad and said, 
I think I want to be a comic artist and writer. Um, and they took it very well. <laughs> you know, they're always very encouraging. I'm sure they were slightly alarmed. Um, but it was, I, I kind of had to admit to myself, this is what I want to spend my time doing. I want to do stories. And I want to do pictures. And, um, but, uh, you know, it was really, it was, it was making me aware of something that I, I thought, how do I want to spend my day? Really? That, that's what it came down to. And I want to enjoy my day. And, and that's still the thing. So, um, you know, we, we spend an awful lot of time doing our work. Um, and if you're doing a job or you're in a career that you're not enjoying, um, that's a lot of time in your life that you're giving up for somebody else, you know? So, um, yeah, that's what it came down to. I thought, what, is, what do I want? What do I want? To, what will I enjoy doing? And and that's what you're able to do now every day and to, to create those different, the very different stories and the very different styles of tor- storytelling that you have um, with the different characters and the different different kinds of books you write for different age groups. But it, it wasn't a straightforward no. journey. I'm, I'm thinking of this particular, I suppose, no. because this is the time of year where young people are making their 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 career choices. Um, yeah, and it's I mean one of the things about Ireland is because it is a small place. Um, you know, um, generally, if you get like full time artist in Ireland, is going to have a very interesting or varied CV. Um, there's there's rarely one type of work that you can make a living out of. Um, so either you're 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 selling stuff abroad, and and nowadays that's becoming increasingly realistic. You know, where you can kind of you can have clients outside of the country, um, and you can specialize. But in my case, I didn't end up doing that. I mean. It, Partly because I was interested in lots of different things and I kept trying different stuff. Um, and partly it's just how I ended up. So, um, so yeah, I work in different art styles depending on what the job is I, or even what the book is. I, I like writing different kinds of things and for different kinds of age groups. Um, and that can be a problem in that people not, you know, particularly publishers don't know exactly where to put you. Um, but on the other hand, I get to do a lot of interesting stuff. You know, I'm really bored with the work I do. Um, and I also get, because I work with lots of different people, I end up getting, um, asked to do get to get involved with projects like this. So this, this started out as, um, I'd done some, um, artwork for Port Leash for their public, um, plan presentations last year, um, or for at least kind of cancel, I should say. Um, and I'd done what was called a graphic recording where you sit and draw while people are talking and it's like a conference or a. Um, a public meeting and you kind of capture ideas and, and write those down. Um, so they brought me in on this kind of the sustainability course that they were doing with local, with local leaders. Um, and then the end of that, I was to produce an exhibition that was inspired by the stuff that we, that we covered on that course. Mm-hmm. So, um, and part of being, you know, part of taking on interesting projects is you get somebody else come along and says, Oh, well, have you ever tried doing this? So, um, it does constantly mean I have to try something new and work out how I'm going to do it, um, which can be interesting. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, generally it kind of, it, it, it does keep things varied. <laughs> can I ask you about um, which comes first for you? Is it the story or the image? Because if somebody was to look at three Oshin McGann books, say for example, one of the Mad Grandad ones, Feel the Change and any of the Kings of the Realm books, they wouldn't necessarily assume that they had been illustrated by the same illustrator. So I'm curious no, about no. which comes to you first. Is it the story or is it the image? Are you um, doodling well, or I mean, writing? In, in publishing, I mean, in my head, they're kind of, they, they come together. So if I'm writing, I would be thinking about how this thing will look. And if I'm drawing something, I'm thinking about what the story is behind it. Um, but really in, in publishing, it's normally the text that comes first. So even with a picture book, where you know you might have pictures on every page, full color pictures on every page, you'll normally have the text coming first. Um, now there is a, there are exceptions to that. Sometimes an illustrator just has a, a kind of a project that they want to do, and they figure out how it's going to look first, and and then work out what the words are going to be. But um, generally, the text comes first, and then they work from that. Um, but the two are together in my head, so it's not like a you know. I do get you know, kids sometimes ask me, which would you rather do, write or illustrate? And for me, it's like asking somebody, would you rather, you know, eat or drink? Um, you know, I, I don't think of them together and I can't imagine doing one, not the other. Now, I was a commercial artist for a long time. So I drew, you know, I drew things for other people. But I was always, always thinking in terms of stories and, you know, what was going on behind the picture. So now you are... Uh 
a, you're, a, you're a long while into your career, let's put it that way. Um, a, yeah. a career in the creative arts is one that a young person should consider in 2024. Um, I mean, I think if, they, if they're going to, they know it. Um, it's, I mean, there's a lot of practical advice you could give somebody and there's, there's an awful lot of advice online. I mean, you can, there's a lot more access to professional artists online now so you can, you can get to hear what the life is like and, and um, what the challenges are. Um, and I think, I think there can be good and bad to that. I mean, there's an awful lot I didn't know when I started out that I wasn't, that wasn't available to me and I think is available now. But um, it's the kind of thing you're, you're either going to do it or you're not. And if you're going to do it, um, you're going to do it because you love doing it. Um, you certainly wouldn't get into this for the money and you wouldn't get into it for fame or um, kind of rewards. The reward is the work um, and the reward is getting paid for something you love doing. So, um, and there's, you know, in very, you know, there's almost no case where you can be employed doing it. So that does mean being self-employed. It does mean working freelance and that doesn't necessarily suit everyone. So, um, I, I think if you're going to make a career out of it, you have to be prepared to be entrepreneurial about it. You're going to have to hustle. Um, but there can be just as much pleasure and reward in, in doing something part time, having another job and doing this for the love of it. You know, um, it's not necessarily all about publishing or, um, you know, those end rewards. It's, it's um, you have to love the process first. And I think if somebody's going to make a career of this, they'll know they want to do it. So, um, you know, it's just dealing with the challenges as they come along. And there are a lot of challenges. Um, but then Ireland is pretty supportive of its art. It's better than some countries in terms of um, the things that are available. But because we are a small country and we have a very small market, um, that, you know, there are downsides to that as well. So um, it's, it's interesting. The challenges when I started out are quite are, are different in a lot of ways than they are now. Um, in some ways, there's a lot more opportunities, but on the other ways, you're up against more competition. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I mean, there's just, there's, there's a lot to it. But the main thing is, if you love the work, you'll do it. You know? If you love the work, you'll do it. It goes for all codes and all practices and all areas of work, doesn't it really? That is the artist and illustrator, Oshin McGann. We are almost there on the programme tonight, but I have one really, really special uh, interview to bring with to you this evening. And that is the second part of last week's interview with James Mack. And it's a really nice follow on, actually, from that piece with Oshin McGann, because it really is the story of somebody who is absolutely following his heart and who worked his way through the the COVID lockdowns and who fearlessly and relentlessly pursued his creativity and is now just stunned by the quality of the work that he has produced and the quality of the journey that he is on. And when Ushin talks there about how the, the world is different for artists, really interesting to hear how James Mack's experience on Glow Up, the TV programme, solidifies part of his journey as well. And that is what we will be talking about after the break here when we come back on Encore. Encore with Patters Bar, your award-winning bar, lounge and beer garden in Moat. Find Patters Bar Moat on Facebook or Instagram. Midlands 103 Just last week I found myself in the Dunham Mace Theatre in the exhibition space upstairs talking to James Mack who is a makeup artist and so much more about the work that was in the room with us. Uh, And I'm going to bring you the second part of that um, interview where we talked about the experience of standing there in that space with a dozen or more images, many of them of James himself in lots of different guises and what that might be like to be standing beside a six foot portrait of yourself in full makeup. It's 90 by one, 90 centimetres by 150 cm so they're a ratio of nearly one to one and a half and that was that was wild for me to see it <laughs> the first time because you know you think oh, God the head and him like there's a fair bit of ego power going on here like it's wild because I, I see it as art and I see you know, I remember doing all of this, but you kind of take yourself out of context. You almost see it in third person again. So the first time I did see it, I got a bit of vertical. I was kind of whizzy on my heel. And I said, oh, my God, I actually thought as well, we're, we're really doing this. Yeah. And this is going to be, you know, on display. And even though I shared all this work on social media and I was going through 
appearing on the show. We got the commission rights for Netflix, which went global. I got 260,000 followers in two weeks in August, August of four years ago. I didn't know how to relate to that because it was never for that reason. Mm -hmm. It was always for me to push myself and discover more. And I think that probably was the secret. When I look back now and I've had time to reflect of how it worked, you know, in, in all of our favours of the contestants on that series. But then with the pandemic, no one predicted what would happen. But I had this time to take everything I'd been through, take what I'd learned and, oh my God, really improved on my makeup skills. Like, um, what happened in 2017-16 <laughs> is in, a, in an archive. <laughs> but the good stuff, you know, the stuff that really felt like this is where I am as an artist, sharing that online, you're getting this exposure, you're getting all this, like, engagement, likes, whatever the numbers are. Nothing has compared to seeing this work mm. in this size, like you've just we've said the measurements, but seeing people come in and getting the physical, like, physical witnessing physically people's reactions. Well, there's something really extraordinary about seeing the art and the artist, and not just being able to, to draw conclusions about the artist from the art, but seeing the artist physically in the art. And we were, you know, we were talking about the ones that, it, it, that, that are... Re- it is a really moving exhibition, and it's such a pleasure to see it. Uh, you are really working hard at the moment on... Uh, a masterclass. Tell us about that. I am. Oh my God. I don't think I've worked in. I've worked for L'Oreal. I've worked for Vogue and Paris Fashion Week, and nothing has come close to the hustle and the grind. Let's say. But I'm super excited. I am going to be doing my first at large scale live makeup demo in the Auditorium Theatre Room in the Dunamays on Friday at 7pm on the 6th of September. So coinciding with the gallery exhibition, the Dunamays have been so, so, so supportive alongside with Creative Ireland Leash that have made this exhibition free, by the way. We have a ticketed administration to the Masterclass on the 6th. I'm bringing what you see as close as in person to life. So this work, people have said, you know, God, you did it. It's amazing that we have like a stamp of your art and your storytelling but there's nothing more powerful and I feel now prepared for it at this point in my career to do something live for people and you know a lot of people have thought what is a makeup masterclass even in the industry whether I'm in the heart of Dublin London Paris any other cities or my you know fellow colleagues a masterclass is so subjective so what is that you say for me, it's going to be what this Makeup Times art is like, like textures and colour patterns and, you know, layers of work that you'll even question. And it'll be me doing makeup on a model in person. Will the work you'd see at the end even feel real? Like, and it's going to be, obviously. But I want people to go away thinking about makeup like they hadn't thought about it before. And I suppose that's... It feels like my duty because of my passion here of what I want to bring back home or what, you know, no matter where I go in the world, I want to share that, the power of what you can do with makeup. Um, What even is more special that I'm doing it in Leash, you know, I'm doing it for the community where I grew up. There was a time that I didn't imagine that being a possibility. So, you know, it's like checking myself when I was younger and just showing and proving it to my younger self as well. So yes, that is all in preparation right now. Um, We are working really hard and just trying to get the message out there that tickets are still available. Um, you can get your tickets at dunamaze.ie. Um, the ticket link is also in my bio on social media, TikTok or Instagram at jmac underscore MUA. And yeah, we've got just short of two weeks to go now. It's exciting. You're excited. And I, I, know, I, seem, I know I seem a little bit distracted because I'm talking to you here. There are all these images of you behind me. And just over your left shoulder, I can see the video oh, that you were talking about and, and all the, another set of iterations of you um, just happening kind of over your shoulder. Yeah, we, you know, that was... By God, am I... Let me just tell you, I'm grateful that I was just flat out on the socials, getting the exposure going, you know, nothing like a bit of image.e that would slap me. <laughs> like, I was just delighted that I was thinking, get the shot, get the footage, without ever having this idea in my mind. But it's probably part of Destiny's Calling that we were going to always do this. The video, just like you said, it, it helps show that this was real, that the, a lot of the video is about five-minute display of work you know, in action, like live motion that, yeah. you know, a lot of people have came in to see this that might not know what makeup can, like the power of what makeup can really do, have questioned me and asked me 
more than a few times, is this AI or is this being altered artificial intelligence or photoshopped? Yeah. And that's a great question because because I guess I'm so wrapped into it myself, I forgot about that. I forgot about that being a, you know, kind of understanding or thought process for people that have never even seen more than a smoky eye and a red lip. And, <laughs> you know, for them to come in and think, mother, what's going on here? Yeah. But that's the, I suppose that's what is being such a journey and it's such a pleasure for me to create this work. It's pushed those boundaries, which is what I want my artistry to do. And yeah, that's being like the videos for reassurance. So loads of people have had loads of reactions and it's made me think about how to explain it better. Because I used to be like, I'd come into my mom and dad in the sitting room where we're still on restrictions and lockdown. And I'm like, ta-da! And they were like, right. Like, oh my God. And then... <laughs> You know, it got to a point where they actually, I remember my mum would come in when I was getting to the end of um, mid-2021, I returned back to London when there was travel restrictions lifted, and I said I'd come back and forth as much as I can. And I remember my mum seeing one of the later pieces, and she goes, hmm, like, it's great, you have done better. <laughs> I'm like, well, that is the most, you know, down to earth, like keeping you grounded, but focused. But it is like, you, you try to excel and, you know, triumph yourself every time you do what feels like your best looks. Like, this does feel like the best series of art I've still done as an artist and as a makeup artist to date. But the 6th of September will be a new chapter and a a whole new level. I I suppose the interesting thing for an audience is is, is you come and and you're right up so close to the images. Um, And and some of them are so textural, like like Earth that we see here. And some of them are almost like masks. Um... Like, for example, uh, Ice Crown, which is a, has a different feeling about it again. And then, you, and you did ask me which my favourite was, which is this one, Freestyle, which is a... Um, I, I almost want to touch it <laughs> to, to see how it's done. Uh-huh. Um, and it's such a really beautiful, <laughs> vulnerable and lovely image. Um, Layers it really. says a lot. You know, they ran out of icing very fast in Cleland so after the because you know, it looks <laughs> like loads of colours and layers like a cake. I'm telling you, red velvet's looking very spicy these days. <laughs> no <I'm> joke. <laughs> um, yeah, it's. What do you see when you look at that, or who do you see? I see actually. There's two different things for me when I've done this like work. I have my favourite final like pieces, the output, the final mm-hmm. result. But then I do remember the process. And I actually had the most at ease and just calmness creating freestyle, the image in question. Mm -hmm. And because for me, it felt like I had no set goal or objective. I was like, just do how you feel. So I was taking like the sense of being in lockdown, the isolation, the, you know, the frustration of thinking. I thought I'd lost my opportunity with the show because we were all, you know, taken to our homes. I went back to Ireland. I thought, how am I going to like, you know, capitalize on this? I put so much work in. It's a competitive field. What's next for me? And I just said, let that all go. So in some ways, I'm a fiend for a bit of vulnerability. I do just draw to emotional intelligence, letting your sensitive and you know, vulnerable side out. And that was just, just a safe ground for me when I did freestyle because it was like, okay, you know what, James? Take a breath, let go. Just let go of like, everything that's happening in the world. We've, we're living in a scary world as it is. So it was like a message to myself and my artistry just, you know, directing that and I really enjoyed the process and it actually took the least amount of time I'm going to say short of an hour some of these did not take an hour <laughs> there's half a day I remember one I started at 7 p.m naively thinking bed by 11 and it was those you could go to work two days a week December 2020 the father came downstairs at 8 a.m and he was like what's going on and that's the hero image we have in the gallery it's the front cover of the brochure and the posters that are available from the Dunamay's um mm-hmm. Art Centre right now. Um, so, you know, I actually, did, I love the thrill of that. I, you know, felt like it was complete in a much shorter space of time, but it wasn't about doing the fastest look I can. It was about how it made me feel. Yeah. The exhibition itself physically is available to come and see until the end of September. And I just want to com- uh, acknowledge as well that there are three headpieces here that are designed from head designer and artist Paul McSpecial. He's based down in Cork. He has created some amazing head designs that were with Bambi Thug in this year's Eurovision. 
competition entry and I contacted Paul in the pandemic and we've developed a very strong relationship, creative relationship and Paul actually came to the launch of the exhibition in London and it's just beautiful that this hasn't just been a solo project. I would say inclusive of like my dad, my dad has taken some photographs, my mom, both parents have been such a huge support to really lift everything off the ground for me and I just want to give a shout out to them. I think in what we're seeing there's about 12 people individually involved because there is some collaborative work here with models and like I said Paul's work and um, we actually have an image titled Makeup Times Art which was the final look from the masterclass I held on the launch day of the London Gallery so I did a masterclass which is like I know that's kind of my stamp in London I wanted to bring what it is I do back home because I, I feel the message even for younger kids and like any budding artist because like you know I'm from Abilix, it doesn't matter where you come from, you can have that drive no matter where you come from, the corner of the country. I never felt like I had to go away to avail of, you know, letting myself be this person or make, you know, achieve what I have to date. Or at least it's important to know I'm honouring where I'm from and bringing it home because I want to inspire younger people. So the image, Makeup Times Art, that's actually a very special image because you have a photographer, Becca Geeden, who knows Paul, that shot the final image. You have a beautiful trans female model called Diamond that is literally covered in glitter and a silver, it looks like a silver chrome diamond, and one of Paul's headpieces. So there's four or five people involved in that work alone, and that's a big reflection of my work that I do in the industry. It really takes teamwork, and everyone has inspired me in my life journey to date, some form or some shape, way or another, when I look back and see this project and all the work I did. It's an homage to my friends, family, people that are no longer with us, the queer community, massively, the LGBTQI plus community, because they, everyone that I've met in my journey is with coming out and finding my self-expression, has heard my story and inspired me to think about what I want to give back into the world. So that is a huge message that co- kind of comes coincide with this exhibition as well. He speaks so well about what he does, uh, doesn't he? That is James Mack and that masterclass is tomorrow night at the Dunamis Art Centre um, and it's a fascinating story and I think particularly coming uh, on the heels of that Oshin McGann piece about young people and creativity, they work really nicely together. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, Dunamis.ie of course if you're interested in getting tickets for tomorrow night. After the break, I'll just give you an update on what else is happening in the world. Stay with us on Encore on Midlands 103. Encore with Patters Bar in Moot with live music every weekend and all sports showing on our big screens. Find Patters Bar Moat on Facebook or Instagram. Midlands 103. Encore at midlands103.com is the email address. I'd always love to hear from you, particularly as we come into this time of the year when drama societies are carrying out their rehearsals, when exhibitions are starting up, when the evenings are in a while, not just yet, but in a while they'll start to close in and people will be organising courses and craft groups, all kinds of things. Drop me a line and let me know what you're doing. I'd love to hear from you. What is happening just at the moment at a theatre near you tonight, starting tonight and going until the 8th of September. You can catch Matilda the Musical at the Mullingar Arts Centre. And on Tuesday night, Paddy Cullivan is there with his show, I Can't Believe It's Not Ireland. Jarleth Regan is at the Dean Crow Theatre in Athlone on the 13th of September. And the last two nights of The Importance of Being Earnest uh, by Oscar Wilde are on tonight and tomorrow night at Athlone Little Theatre. Time just to get in tomorrow evening, I'd say tonight, maybe a little bit late. The Don't forget that next Friday week, so that's the 20th of September, is Culture Night. All over the Midlands there are phenomenal free events that you can go along to. There's a whole series of them so you can spend your day going from one terrific event to another in Leash, Offaly and Westmeath. Culturenight.ie has all of the details. And one slightly outside our um, our catchment area here, I suppose, but still really, really interesting, particularly if you are a reader um, or if you're a general culture fan. But on Culture Night, the opening of Culture Night is, is happening at Visual in Carlo, which is a beautiful venue, but it is also 
15 years old. And to celebrate its 15th birthday, they will have Colm Tobin in the main auditorium. So um, the visual Carla will give you all the details about that. Encore at Midlands103.com is the email address. Please do get in touch with me. The great Joe Cooney is in the building. He's strumming away across the way and he'll be in here just in a couple of minutes after the news at eight o'clock. On Saturday morning, I'll be back with Mixtape Nua. The theme of fire is what we'll be playing. Or sorry, the theme of ice this week. It'll be fire next week is what we're playing with. Playing with fire and ice. Thanks for your company this evening. Until I talk to you again, take care of yourself. Good night. Good night.